Good evening. Good evening. Where do we all come from? <laughs> yes, well, tomorrow night, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, all I can say is that at 8 o'clock each of those evenings, something will happen here. But what, I really don't know. We are supposed to have tapes. To begin with, perhaps uh, you haven't the right idea of what we're doing, because it hasn't, I haven't explained it very well. All of the tape recordings <coughs> are of lectures and classes actually given, and the tape recordings were made at the time they were given, just like our class and lecture work has been done here. But there have been six lectures that were given in Seattle, that have had to be done over again because uh, they were somewhat faulty on the tape. And it is those that we've had typewritten and uh, that we are doing over again on tape. I'm explaining that for this reason. When you hear our tapes in the future, uh, don't think that they have just been read off of manuscripts. They haven't been. They have been delivered just like we are talking here tonight or as we have been this past week at lectures and classes. It is only this six that have had to be done over again and read into the uh, uh, machine in order to get better copies. Now, for every hour of tape recording, it takes six to eight hours to type the manuscript. And... Uh, so we are far behind in getting that done. Well, our secretary has been working every night typing until 1 a.m. And uh, she's working over there tonight again for 1 a.m., hoping to have another one ready for tomorrow night and possibly another one for Friday night. But in any case, we'll be here tomorrow night, Thursday night, Friday night, at 8 o'clock with something on our mind. Whatever it is, we'll accept with grace. And this tonight has been set aside for questions and answers. And the first is, what is the difference, if any, between realization and illumination? In some ways, realization and illumination may be used interchangeably in the degree that we may be illumined on a certain subject. Realization is usually used in this way, that if we have a problem, we receive a realization of some specific truth regarding that problem. And so, while realization may be used uh, in a general sense as to say, I have had the realization of truth, it isn't often used that way. It is uh, most frequently used in the sense of, I have had a realization regarding this particular problem, this particular ill, or this particular, on this particular truth. But illumination really means an illumination of consciousness on the subject of truth. We are never illumined just on one subject or on one problem. When illumination comes, it comes in the form of uh, an illumination of truth, an illumined consciousness of truth. Now, realization then may be correctly used when we have some problem or other or are thinking of some particular truth and say, oh, I've had a realization about that either about the problem, its solution, or the truth. But when we talk of illumination, we will talk of it as the illumination of consciousness, which means uh, illumination in truth, and that would cover the broad subject of truth. There would be, there may be, degrees of illumination. For instance, Saul of Tarsus had an illumination on the road to Damascus. But he didn't start out on his ministry 
for nine years after that. So we may assume that that illumination on the road to Damascus was merely the first of a series, that it was merely the beginning, and that somewhere in the next nine years that illumination continued to grow and evolve until he had the complete sense that sent him out on his missionary tours. In the same way, I often think of my experience in 1928 as an illumination. It wasn't an illumination in the sense that I gained a consciousness of truth. That's, that's true. It was merely an illumination of consciousness which lifted me above the human sense of existence and enabled me to be doing healing works the very next day. Now, if you had asked me what the truth of being was, or if you had asked me what is truth, I could no more have told it to you after the illumination than before. The only difference in me before and after was that before the illumination, I was just an average businessman indulging the usual business experiences, social drinking, card playing, horse racing, and all the things that belong to an ordinary businessman's human existence. But after the illumination, I never even had a thought in my head about smoke or drink or cards or horses or any of the things that ordinarily had filled my uh, time and thought. And on the contrary, when uh, two days later, one of my customers who was an alcoholic, mm -hmm. out of a clear sky said, you could heal me if you would. I was stunned and surprised, but I said, if you think so, I will, and she was healed. And the next day, another man asked for help and had a healing, and next week, someone else. And within a year, I was professionally practicing healing. And yet, if you had said, what did the illumination consist of? What was the truth of being? I couldn't have told you anything. Didn't know a thing about it. Now, at a later period, there came little tiny experiences of illumination that showed me the truth about certain aspects of life. It wasn't a whole picture. It was just a glimpse here, a glimpse there, a little light here and a little light there, and it came piecemeal in that way until <clears throat> 1945 when the voice said, Next year, 1946, is your year of transition. And it was. In 1946, beginning in July, I went through an experience of being awakened out of sleep every morning at 5 o'clock and being caused to sit in a chair until 7. For two solid hours, every day for two hours, I went through an inner illumination that seemed to open up as if I were witnessing, oh, the equivalent of a Masonic initiation. It was as if I were witnessing a marvelous uh, initiation a ceremony and being initiated into spiritual truth. And that went on for two months, and that I really consider the first illumination that was an illumination of uh, something that I could specifically grab hold of and say, now I know what this is and this is and this is and I can tell it. And uh, that was the year in which the infinite way was completed. And from then on, every few months, I had one of those experiences that carried me further along the line. That is illumination. But if I sit down to work on some problem for you and all of a sudden I get the answer, I call that realization. Is that clear? After we have illumination to serve, does one need a college education? No. No, I am not going to say that we need any education since the disciples got along pretty well without any schooling, or without very much of it, and many people have gotten along without it, and I don't seem to be doing too badly. I never went beyond grammar school. I only had six months of uh, 
business high school. Actually, my diploma from grammar school was as far as my education went. And then I never saw the inside of a schoolroom again until I was 47 years of age and I was admitted to Harvard to take a course in Indic philology, Sanskrit and Oriental philosophy, so forth, which lasted something over a year. But it wasn't a general education. I was never admitted to Harvard as a regular student. It was as a special student and just on three subjects. So that actually my schooling ended at grammar school and uh, it hasn't, so far, it hasn't hindered the work. I will admit that sometimes I get in company where they're very disdainful of me because I haven't got a PhD or at least a master's, but uh, it doesn't happen very often. Spiritual intuition has nothing to do with education, and sometimes education can stand in its way. You see, Scripture is a stumbling block unless one is able to discern it through spiritual sense. Scripture and all spiritual writing never, never could be reasonable. It never could appeal to the reasoning mind. That's why so few real scholars have ever had much faith in the Bible. And you can't blame them. If you read the Bible in its literal sense, it doesn't make sense. You only have to start it and read the first chapter of Genesis and the second chapter of Genesis, and by that time you're through and say, this must be the work of a crazy man. And if you read the Song of Solomon from uh, the standpoint of the human intellect, you won't think of it as a very spiritual writing. You'll wonder what part of the world we drift into to get that kind of language and literature. Only as you read the Song of Solomon through spiritual intuition can you see that it is one of the great mystical writings, one of the great spiritual writings, and has nothing to do with the subjects that it seems to portray. And so it is. Think of passages like, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, wherewithal you shall be clothed. Well, if you're not going to take thought for it, who's going to do it? And, of course, to spiritual sense, you would say God. But then the man without spiritual sense looks out in the world and says, he doesn't seem to be doing much of a job for these people. Be better off if they depended on their good right arm. You see, we have a wonderful example of that today in our own uh, modern life. <clears throat> the Russians are realistic. They don't believe in the God that the churches teach because they say that that God hasn't done much for its people. And so they depend on their reasoning power, on their arms, their ammunition, their scheming, plotting, and planning. And uh, offhand, uh, you must admit they're doing a much better job than the nations that are depending on some kind of an unknown God. Because it is true, and from their standpoint it is true, that the God of the churches has failed the people. No question about that. The people are far worse off today than they were a hundred years ago, except so far as gadgets are concerned. Got more washing machines and electric apparatuses, but so far as actual living conditions are concerned, the average man today with $300 a month income is far worse off than the man of uh, 75 years ago with uh, $25 a week income, $20 a week income. Now, the answer to all that is this. The God of the churches isn't God, and it is for that reason that it isn't upholding the people. <clears throat> when we had World War I and World War II, we had a war between the Christian nation of uh, England, the Christian nation of Germany, the Christian nation of the United States. Why should God have picked any one of those nations to favor over another? Certainly, the sins and evils of the British nation 
were far greater than those of the German nation, so if it was a matter of right and wrong, Britain should have lost both wars. Well, as a matter of fact, you might say she has. Yes, she has. She has, but as a matter of fact, every nation lost the war. None won it. There wasn't any God in uh, those wars, nor was there a God to help the people in those wars, and they weren't helped. And so a nation like Russia stands by and says, what good was your God? What good is your God? The might of Britannia is gone, the might that was Germany is gone, and the might that was America's is going fast. So where is your God, and what has your God done? And so they turn to the opposite of that, to physical might and mental might, and they say, see what we are achieving. Very much like the uh, magicians of old who try to tell Moses that they could equal Moses' work. They could up to a certain point, and then they lost out. Now, we have come to this point that we are watching Russia and its might through materialism, atheism, and uh, thinkers are saying to themselves, what is the answer? The more and more you're reading in the paper that the answer is God and that the answer is spiritual power. But you're not reading that the answer is church or going to church. You read very little of that except in church papers. But you do read a lot about that the answer is going to be found in God or in spiritual power. As a matter of fact, Collier's Magazine ran a series of articles recently by a reporter in search of God. This reporter had been hearing a lot, too, about how the churches had failed and how materialism was coming to the fore, and he decided to make an investigation to see what uh, this thing about God was or is. And he started off in his first article by interviewing Protestant ministers, Catholic priests, and Hebrew rabbis, and uh, the religious head of a college, co-educational college. In that article, the ministers, the priests, the rabbi, and the head of the college were all unanimous in declaring that we must not look to God, there is no hope from God. None. Get busy and look to your arms and ammunition and your human uh, methods of warfare and whatever it is that you're going to do because there is no answer to be found in God. We can't look to God to help us in our human affairs. Wait until you die, and God will help you in the next world. That was unanimous in this first article. In the second article, this reporter interviewed men of uh, international fame and reputation, one of them General Wainwright. The reporter asked General Wainwright, do you believe in God? And General Wainwright said, certainly, he's always to be found on the side of the mightiest battalion. And uh, most of the others agreed the same way, that if you just keep your ammunition dry and pray, that the two together might get you somewhere. But of the two, the most important was to keep your ammunition dry and handy. Now, if you look at the history of, oh, only the last two or three hundred years, the, uh, call it church history, of the world, you will find very much of success in bringing God into the human scene, into our human welfare. I do not mean by that that there haven't been individuals in all churches who have not made contact with God, because they have. As far back as history goes, there have been individuals in church and out of church who made their contact with God. Being in or out of a church never stopped an individual from making contact with God if there was something within their own being that brought them to it, as, for instance, men like Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman certainly knew God and certainly had a God contact from childhood on, but he has very little of a church history. And, of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson knew God and proved it by leaving the church because the church interfered with the demonstration of God. He was a prominent minister in New England, and he was the fourth minister 
in his family out of four generations of ministers and yet he left it because the church was an interference with God now then spiritual illumination has nothing to do with education or how well you know the history of the Bible or the peoples of the Bible or the divisions of the Hebrew races or the succession the apostolic succession it has nothing to do with that it has to do with contacting God with realizing God with an inner illumination and uh, education has nothing to do with that one of the greatest mystics even to this day one of the most widely read is Jakob Bohm of Germany a cobbler of no education and yet a man whose writings are very widely read for their mystical import because of his direct contact with God so it has always been education is not necessarily a barrier if a person can transcend some of that thinking ability reasoning ability and get up into the intuitive mind but lack of education likewise is no barrier the thing that is a barrier to illumination is the very quality that has made the church fail the intellectual approach to religion basing it on human reasoning and setting up ceremonies rites and creeds as if they had anything to do with one's contact with God setting us out certain rules and regulations of human conduct as if that had anything to do with finding God oh no there have been sinners like Oscar Wilde I mean sinners in the human sense of the word and sinners like our friend in San Francisco what's his name love can open prison doors star, star daily. daily that didn't interfere with spiritual illumination it didn't interfere with their contacting God the fact that he had never been to school and the fact that he'd never been to church when the readiness came God came and the illumination has been constant with him no it isn't that education is necessary but here is what is necessary when one goes out into the public ministry they are not apt to be well received or credited or accepted as authority if they go out with a sense of illiteracy with a sense of personal uncleanness or personal lack of care in their makeup in other words a person must show forth in their ministry some of the qualities of God which would come with uh, illumination and that of course would wipe out any such thing as illiteracy or profanity or vulgarity or coarseness or commonness as you well know those are things that have nothing to do with education it is true that education sometimes wipe those out of a person who ordinarily would have them but actually it is possible to be a very well accepted human without a great degree of uh, education yes the power within prepares the place for us and not only that but it uh, wipes out some of the signs of lack of education lack of culture lack of refinement and uh, so forth how would a truly illumined soul die would they make an ascension well it depends what you mean by ascension if you mean would they carry would they not leave a body behind them there have been very few in history who have gone and uh, not left a body behind at least left what appears to our sense to be a body an illumined individual doesn't die virtually they walk out of their body they come to a place where they decide that I've gone far enough in this experience and I'm ready for the next if you remember the experience of Buddha he just called his uh, disciples in one afternoon and said I'm leaving you tonight and that night he had a discourse with them talked with them lie down and said goodbye and went to their sense he left a body 
for cremation. And they had a cremation as is usual in India. In the same way Brown Landone in uh, Florida, he was 97 years and nine months of age, and he was in the prime of health. He was in perfect health. He was in as fine a health as any of us here, and uh, in appearance he was as young. As a matter of fact, many times he was taken for my younger brother. And uh, Firstly, while he was bald on top, what hair he had was brown, not gray. And he had all of his own faculties and no artificial ones. And he had a very trim young figure. He was able to swim, play golf, ride his airplane, right smack up to the day of his going. And he was able to continue working. He averaged one hour and 50 minutes sleep out of every 24 hours. And the rest of the time he worked. When you called his office for an appointment and was told it would be 2 o'clock, you were also told whether it was 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. because it could have been either, and you had no choice about it. If you wanted to see Brown and he said 2 a.m., you got there 2 a.m. or there was no appointment. His appointments went all the way through to 5 in the morning. At 5 in the morning, he quit and slept, usually until about 7 o'clock. His average was only an hour and 50 minutes per day for 24 hours. And he only ate one meal in 24 hours. At 3 o'clock in the morning, he had a good, healthy, hearty meal. The rest of the time, he merely had orange juice, I mean, uh, tomato juice, orange juice, or black coffee. And one good meal a day. And that man put in more work than any dozen of us men in this room put together. I'm sure he wrote a whole magazine every month. He wrote never less than six, eight, nine books a year. He kept, kept a healing practice of usually around 3,000 patients all the time. And he had a correspondence that took three secretaries working eight hours, three eight-hour shifts in the day while he dictated to keep those three secretaries busy. And uh, at 97 years and nine months of age, he didn't have an ache or a pain in his body. But he called in his secretary this afternoon, and he said, I am leaving. I have some work to do, and I'm leaving. And the secretary, not understanding him, said, well, uh, <coughs> you're not going any place that I don't go with you. Oh, he said, you can't go where I'm going now. He said, I'm off on a mission. I've been called, and you ought to take over and uh, complete this work here. And Brown sat down on his sofa, leaned back, and that was that he walked out. He also, to our sense, left a body to be cremated. Now, <clears throat> we had a man, Bicknell Young, yes, it was Bicknell Young, who was 99 years of age, Christian science practitioner, teacher, lecturer, at 99 years of age, he was called back to Boston to teach the Metaphysical College. To begin with, he's the only man in the history of the Christian Science Movement that ever taught it three times. Teaching the Christian Science uh, Metaphysical College is about the highest honor and place there is because it means teaching uh, the next three years' teachers. And at 99 years of age, he was called to that important work. And it was some months after that, he went on a lecture tour after that, doing one-night stands, as these lecturers do. And one day he was sitting at the desk, dictating to his secretary, perfect health. He looked at her and he said, oh, if I could only tell you of this beautiful scene that I'm witnessing, this is really it. And he went to sleep and that was the end of Bickner the Young so far as the earth plane was concerned. And to our sense, he also left the body for cremation. Now, <clears throat> this is the answer of how an human soul leaves. Either they decide when it's time to go, and they go. Jesus said, I can lay down my life or pick it up. Or they come to a point where they are called and they obey the call and they go. That's the way an illumined soul goes. Now then, 
as for the second part whether or not they leave a body I will have to answer you truthfully no they don't and the fact that their students and disciples have seen a body doesn't change the answer at all they never left the body and I'm going to tell you something further nobody in the history of the world has ever left the body here for burial or for cremation there is no such thing in the history of the world as a body left behind by anybody for burial or for cremation that which we see at the funeral is our concept of our friend or relative it is not their body that is the image of them that we are carrying around I could put it this way and say you think you see me up here and you don't you don't see me at all you don't know what I look like the only way you could ever know what I look like is if you were in treatment or in meditation and caught a spiritual glimpse of me you would know what I'm like but what you're seeing up here is the human mind's concept a very limited and false concept of the I that I am you may be assured of this I am not in a body nor are you because anything I'm saying of myself please understand I'm saying of you I'm not setting myself aside not even Jesus Christ aside God ha is no respecter of persons anything is true of one is true of all we are not in these bodies we have uh, done this perhaps it'd be well if we do it here because after all this little experiment uh, is partly responsible for our whole infinite way demonstration I'm going to ask you to follow me in this will you look down at your feet and will you ask yourself this question is that me down there or are those feet mine is that me down there or are they mine and now travel up to the knee and ask yourself is that me down there or is that mine and now go on on up to the waist and ask yourself is that me or is that mine and keep right on up to the neck and find out whether that is me there or whether that is mine and go right up to the top of the head to the topmost hair of your head and ask yourself is that me or is that mine and what is the answer is it me at any point of that body could you find yourself in that body no of course not that's all mine that's all yours there isn't a single place between your toenails and the topmost hair of your head where you could find yourself because you are not there and you never were there and you never will be there never this is just as much of a vehicle as your automobile and just as you are never in your automobile you occupy your automobile but you're not in an automobile neither are you in uh, this body and you can search this body and do this experiment for head to foot and do it over and over and over again and go to surgical colleges and ask them if they ever found John Jones in a body or Mary Smith and I'm sure they'll tell you they've never found anybody in a body they never will because there isn't anybody in a body and there never was no you are invisible because you are consciousness you are life eternal you are soul you are spirit you are the way the truth and the life you are life eternal you are soul you are the resurrection you are the power itself you are infinite being you are God made manifest you can't confine God in a skull bone you can't confine God in a human body you can't even confine Christ in a human body and Jesus told you that if you destroy this temple he didn't say if you destroy me he knew you couldn't destroy me if you destroy this temple I will raise it up again he didn't say I will be raised up I will raise this temple if you destroy it this I isn't in a temple this I isn't the temple and the temple isn't I 
But if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up. That's why a practitioner can heal you or me. Because no matter what happens to your temple, the right spiritual awareness on the part of the practitioner will restore it. And don't ever doubt for a moment that there have been practitioners in our age who have even restored those who have passed on. It has been done just as it was done in the days of Jesus. It has been done in modern days, probably not to the extent that it was formally done, not to the extent that we should be doing it, but it has been done. Why? Because the consciousness of an individual is God. It isn't man. It isn't body. It isn't limitation. It isn't finiteness. The consciousness, the spiritually developed consciousness of an individual is God. And God is not confined to body. Now then, is God, spirit, soul, walking around using a material body? No. No. This temple of the living God is spiritual. This body is spiritual. And the only thing about this body that is material is our concept of it. The body itself is spiritual. The concept we entertain of it is material, just as if you were to entertain the belief that that ring is silver. There wouldn't make anything silver about the ring at all. It's platinum. And the only silver about it would be the false concept of it that you entertain. And so it is, this body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This body is the temple of God. This body is infinite, immortal, and eternal. But we have accepted the world's concept of it, and we call it material. And as long as we entertain that concept of it, we will bury our concept. We'll never bury our body. We will bury our concept. And so, as long as you think this is me up here, it is possible that you will accept the belief that you can bury me, or even if you accept the belief that this is my body that you're seeing, you may accept the belief that you are watching it be buried, but this isn't my body. My body is here, but you can't see it. You are right now entertaining your concept of body, the concept of body. I think that's why some of us say this girl is beautiful and another one say this girl is beautiful. I don't see how you can say that one is beautiful. I don't think we're seeing the beauty of the girl. We're seeing our concept of beauty. And uh, because if the girl were beautiful, everyone would agree on it. The girl isn't beautiful. It's our concept that's either beautiful or not beautiful. No. No, let us understand this now. The principle of life is this, that God is the causative principle. Do you believe that God made something to decay, to rot, to fall away, to be diseased? No, God never did that. All of that goes on in our false concept of existence. And so, even though Jesus was buried in the tomb, and everyone agrees on that, they were all there at the funeral. Very happy, too, to be there and watch that burial. I bet it gave them a great source of satisfaction to say that fellow's out of the way now, and we've watched him be put away, and we've put that stone there so that he can't get through. Oh, there must have been a great deal of satisfaction about that. And you know as well as I do that they were agreed that he was dead than that he was buried. They saw it. You can't have better proof than that, can you? The only trouble with it was that he was seen walking the earth after the burial. And now we come to a question of theology. How about the thousands of people that saw the death and the burial of Jesus and saw him sealed into the tomb? Will we take their word, the thousands of people, or will we take the word of 500 people who saw him walk the earth after the funeral? Now, that's a very serious question because there were many more who saw him dead and buried than ever saw him walk the earth after the resurrection. Will we believe the thousands or the few hundred? Well, it all depends on uh, 
which way you look at it. If you're satisfied to take the opinion of human sight, then Jesus was not resurrected, and he's still in that tomb, or what's left of him. If you take the word of people who through their development were known to have been spiritual in their approach to life, people who caught the vision of that which cannot be seen, then you would say, I'd rather take the word of one of them than of 10,000 of the others. So it is with us. If you take the word of the undertakers, then bodies have been left for burial and for cremation. And those bodies don't come to earth anymore. But if you take the word of the few who have sometimes attended funerals and seen the very individual being buried actually standing up there laughing at the whole performance, if you want to take the word of that one as against the hundreds of others who are witnessing the funeral, then uh, you would have been one of that 500 that witnessed the resurrection because that is the truth of being. The truth of being is this. In uh, spiritual illumination, you are able to see those whom human sense has died and been buried. Again, some of you, I'm sure, have had the experience, and I can tell you that I have. I can tell you that I have. My own wife passed on and came back to me three times in three days, and each time with a specific message. And I'm not a spiritualist, and I'm not a believer in the dead returning to life nor have I ever delved, in, delved into occultism or spiritualism, but I had the actual experience of witnessing six hours after her passing, witnessing her stand by my side talking to me. I had the actual experience 12 hours later when going through terrible pains of a headache through the excitement and uh, stress of what I'd been through with her, and uh, fighting myself, arguing, I can help other people, I just couldn't help my own wife or myself, and where is this God that I'm preaching about and talking about, and having all the rest of these arguments that you probably had yourself at times, when instantaneously she was standing by my side and said, oh, Joel, why don't you stop that battle? The battle isn't yours, but God's. The battle takes place in uh, your consciousness. Your consciousness is the arena between uh, that which we call God, which is good, and a non-existent, a supposititious thing called evil. It isn't even real. And if you just leave it alone and don't enter into the battle, that good will dissolve the illusion of the evil. And that quickly I was healed. And the third time was the next morning when I awakened and realized that because of a peculiar circumstance I was without funds and I thought, my, what am I going to do now? That quickly she was back there and took me over to my bookcase and pointed to a book and told me the page to open to. And when I opened to that page, it said, in your new consciousness, you will have health and wealth, health to enjoy wealth and wealth to enjoy health. And I don't mind telling you that within 24 hours, that new consciousness started to build up the temple of my finances again. Now, that wasn't the only experience. I've had many. I had a patient pass on who was under pressure in his family. And he said to me, he said, you can't save me, nor can anyone else. He said, the pressure in this house is too great. They don't want me, and I haven't got the resistance to overcome it. And he says, I know enough on the inside to know that you're not going to succeed as hard as you're trying. He said, I'm going tonight. But he said, I want to tell you this. I've already had the assurance of immortality, not only of my soul, but of my body. And he said, I want you to be on the lookout for me for three days. Because he said, I'm going to appear to you to show you that this is true. Well, it was the third day, my wife and I, this wife who passed on, were sitting in the living room looking toward a window when she said, look, look, 
and I looked up and there was my friend Henry. We both saw him and he just waved this way and was on about his business. Strangely enough, he was wearing the same suit of clothes I'd last seen him in. This isn't imagination. Take my word for it that I have been 23 years in this healing work and I've seen enough people healed of one disease or another, one condition or another, to know that there's nothing dreamlike about this work. It's actual and it's practical. I've seen people raised from sickness just as I was raised from death twice. It's practical. There's nothing dreamy about it. And when I say to you that we don't die, and the body doesn't die, and it doesn't get buried or cremated, I really mean it in an intensely practical way, in the same way that Jesus meant it when he said, look, flesh and blood, it's the same wounds, it's the same skin. Don't you see it's the same body? Why, I'll even eat and drink with you to prove to you that it's the same body that was crucified. They don't bury bodies or cremate them. They walk the earth again. Only they're invisible to material sense, but they're not invisible to spiritual sense. Now, never think that you are going to be a healer if you judge by material sense. If you're going to judge materially, then your friend, relative, or patient has a sick material body and there's anything you can do about it. It is only through spiritual sense that you can look at that appearance of disease, that body, and still see the body of God in its complete integrity, in its complete spiritual nature, and thus bring out healing. And so it is with us other. Never think that with the human eyes you're going to see the bodies of those who have passed on. You're going to have to develop the same spiritual sense that enables you to be a healer. And if you develop that, you will witness those who have, uh, to our sense of things, passed on. That's how an human soul dies. That's how everybody else dies, too, only they don't know it. The unillumined get kicked out of their sense of life by sin and disease, and the illumined walk out. Would an illumined soul free from disease have an accident like a train wreck and so forth, or would they cause accidentally someone else to get hurt? Well, they wouldn't cause it, but it might happen to them if uh, that was the way of bringing to them the realization that it was their time to go further. If they were clinging too hard to the material sense of existence, they might have, but I don't think that it has happened uh, too often. There is, of course, a mistaken idea as to what constitutes an illumined soul. We have had in the religious world, <coughs> uh, well, last year we had one of those credited with being the most illumined souls on earth in this age. Sri Mahashi, he passed on with a very, very painful disease. Doesn't seem to have been any reason for it, but it may have been due to his false concept of truth, which they, of course, entertain in the Orient. I don't know. Before that, Ramakrishna and Vivekananda passed on with very dangerous and uh, painful diseases. The question is uh, always been how much illumination did they have or how much were they fooled by the oriental teaching that there is a spirit which inhabits a material body? Now, both of those men had illumination to some degree, but they were both victims of the belief that they themselves were spiritual, but that they inhabited a material body. That is the oriental teaching, and it's one of those that wrecks pretty nearly all orientals, and certainly it has wrecked India, China, Burma, Siam, and all those countries that cling to the belief that we are a spirit inhabiting a material universe and the better, the faster we get rid of it, the better off we'll be. They get rid of it pretty fast. The uh, longevity in India is 29 years. They get rid of it pretty fast. My friends seem to think it a crime for me to want to see my business prosper and make money. No, no, there's no crime in the business prospering and making money. Heavens no. The crime is in the way the money is made. If money is made in a legitimate business conducted in a sense of love, integrity, fairness, justice, honesty, mercy, why shouldn't it prosper? Of course it should. And of course, the more the business would be in tune with spiritual law, the more it would prosper. There again comes that oriental belief of asceticism, and uh, it creeps into our belief sometimes. 
Well, I guess the church, the church started it in, uh, I mean, in the Occident at least, the church started it because the church had to make it stylish for you to be poverty stricken so it could get rich. How is it going to get you to give up the money except to tell you how noble it is to be poor? And never doubt for a minute that was its purpose and that is its purpose. No other purpose. If anyone at all tells you there's any virtue in poverty, ask them why the master fed the thousands that he fed. Why not let him starve if there's so much virtue in poverty and starvation? Why did he multiply loaves and fishes to feed them? Why did he say that the Father knoweth that we have need of food and, food and clothing and raiment and housing if we are supposed to be poverty stricken? Oh, no, 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 no. No, <clears throat> the church has got to find some way to get the average individual to give up. And that's the best way to show you the virtues of poverty. Then you can be virtuous, really virtuous. Just give it all to the church. But remember this, never does a church say that there is any virtue in their being in poverty. Oh, no. $21 million to build this church, $14 million to build that church, $65 million in the Christian Science Church in Boston, how many hundreds of millions in the Roman Catholic? There's no poverty, and there's no virtue in the church being in poverty stricken. Only you and me. That's all. Oh, not the priests and not the cardinals and not the bishops. They are not poverty stricken. If you've seen the mansions they live in, you'll know that it's true that they are not poverty stricken. No virtue for them just for us and that we they help us they help us to get virtuous because they'll take our money from us if we let them <laughs> they impart virtue to us in strange ways no there is no virtue in poverty but neither is there any virtue in making money for money's sake neither is there any virtue in getting rich for the sake of being rich oh no that's just the opposite end of the stick the virtue lies in living the life of the golden rule. The virtue lies in conducting a business that stands for service, integrity, value. And then if that business brings in wealth and that wealth is put to good purposes, there is your virtue. I think it's much more a virtue for Mr. Latourno to hand over $16 million a year to educational institutions throughout the United States and youth institutions uh, than it would be for him to walk around poverty-stricken. Oh, I think there's much more virtue in his handing out that $16 million every year from his business. And I also think it's much more virtuous for Henry Ford to be able to turn over $180 million for educational purposes to a foundation than if we had witnessed him walking around the earth poverty-stricken and unable to employ a hundred thousand men at tremendous wages and then leave 180 million besides for educational purposes. You might uh, find interest in an article that ran in uh, Collier's magazine recently by the man who is chairman of the board of directors of, Ge of General Motors, Mr. Sloan. Mr. Sloan, in his article, <clears throat> said that this is the last generation in America of people who will be allowed to accumulate wealth. That from this generation on, nobody will be permitted to retain more than enough to pay their rent, food, clothing, and income tax. Everything else will be taken from them. And by this last bill, you can pretty nearly see that it's right. <clears throat> Now, he said that his interest in writing this article was this. Our free educational institutions like universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, are supported by endowments from rich men, principally. Boys graduate from these universities, go out into the world and make good or inherit money, and eventually give or leave large sums of money to these institutions, and these institutions carry on their educational work. Now, says Mr. Sloan, that is no longer possible. There are no men in America today anymore 
who are able to contribute anything to these universities. Because every man with an income that large is being taxed the full amount of his income above his actual living expenses. So our answer is always, there is no virtue in poverty, and there is no virtue in riches. If there is any virtue, it is in our mode of life, and our mode of life should produce from us in will, if it's along Christian lines, if it's along the lines of service, integrity, and so forth, it will produce not only all that we need, but an abundance that is called wealth. So many things start to go wrong with us. Very often that's a very good sign. For this reason, let us suppose that outwardly we're in perfect health. We haven't a pain or an ache. And therefore, we believe that we're healthy. Have you not known it to be true that there were people who went along years and years and years without pain, believing they were perfectly healthy, and then all of a sudden died of a heart attack or died of a cancer attack? And the doctor said, or the family said, why, they never knew they were sick. Nobody ever knew they were sick. It all came to the surface in one splurge. Well, supposing we are walking around sick with one illness or another, and we come to uh, truth and it stirs us up so that the pain begins and we really find out we're not as healthy as we were. It gives us an opportunity to take up specific work and have a healing, doesn't it? Whereas otherwise that might lie dormant for years and years and years and then crack and carry us off. So very often the latent diseases in thought, the latent diseases in our body, those that are lying there without painting us, come to the surface. And that is one reason for it. Now there is another reason. And this is the main reason. Before we come to truth studies, we are human beings with material bodies. And we are dependent on certain foods, medicines, thoughts, things. We come to truth now, and we're going to make a complete change. We're going to give up our entire dependence on material things and uh, place our reliance on the infinite invisible. Well, just as we would find it difficult to take off these glasses and try to get along without them for a while, just as a person using a cane would find it difficult at first to get along without it. So as we begin to give up our reliance on material remedies, on material resources, do we commence to miss them, and in missing them they set up a reaction that we might call pain or unpleasant happenings. And we have to go through with that until we make the transition from relying on material good to a complete dependence on the infinite invisible. And right there, let me show you something. That separates the entire infinite way teaching from the metaphysical field. And few people seem to catch that point, that the infinite way is not a teaching that claims to give you a healthier material body or a wealthier material purse or some more human good or companionship or a new automobile or a new house. The whole purpose of the infinite way is to enable us to make a transition from dependence on material forces, material powers, material modes of life to the spiritual. We have nothing to do with demonstrating things. We have nothing to do with demonstrating so-called health. Our demonstration is a demonstration of the conscious realization of God. Once we attain that, we then have health, wealth, and harmony, but we have it as an added thing, and we have it as a spiritual quality, not material. In other words, we live then through Christ, not through dependence on material modes and means. That is the depth of the whole message of the infinite way. It is not merely a metaphysical process, process 
of demonstrating a better heart, liver, or lung, or demonstrating a better pocketbook or home. Those are the added things, that's true. But the object of the message of the infinite way is to enable us to show us how to die daily to our human good and be reborn into our spiritual good. Never doubt for a minute that there is a spiritual realm, a spiritual kingdom, and uh, that the things that God has prepared for us are far greater than even multiplying ten times over the material things that men have prepared for us. There is our secret in the infinite way that we are peeking into the spiritual kingdom and starting while here on earth to inherit and enjoy the gifts of God, not just more gifts of man or multiplications of human good, but the actual activities and uh, supplies and ideas of the spiritual kingdom. Our work is based on the master's statements such as, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm not here just to give you freedom from Caesar. I'm here to introduce you to a freedom in Christ which once you attain, you'll not only be free from Caesar, you'll be free from tyranny throughout the rest of all time. I'm not here to set up food kitchens across the Holy Land so that you'll get lots of food. I'm here to demonstrate, to show you how to demonstrate the presence of God so that you will have meal times regularly throughout all time. That was the mission of the Master. The mission of the Master never was merely to make demonstrations of food. He only fed the people three times. Oh no. His purpose was to show them a principle which, if they learned, would result in their eating regularly forever. He never accepted the crown that was offered him or the purple robe or the general's uniform that was offered him to go out with an army and fight Rome. Oh no, he knew how many times the Hebrews had been in slavery, and he probably could have told us how many more times they were going to be in slavery too, until someday when they awaken to the realization that Christ wasn't born on a certain day, that Christ is an activity of God in our consciousness that is born when we open our consciousness to it, and that it is an individual experience, and that it is one to which the Hebrew as well as the Gentile or Christian is entitled, and to which everyone may have. Now then, once an individual comes to the place where he can say, I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me, the Father within me doeth the work, he is then, or she is at a place of spiritual awareness, in which they still perform their usual duties throughout the day but have no dependence or reliance on them as a means of support, as a means of health, as a means of anything else except the enjoyment of the moment. All power now is vested in that which we call the Christ. And the Christ is that presence that goes before us to make the crooked places straight. The Christ is that which heals, saves, regenerates. The Christ is that which is ever with us. It was before Abraham. And it will be unto the end of the world. And so, as we make the transition from dependence on the human to the dependence on that infinite invisible, we are apt to have a cracking up. We are apt to have periods of sickness or periods of, uh, it says here, unpleasant experiences or impurities coming to the surface. Anything may happen during that period until the Christ itself becomes evident. After 2,000 years of Christianity, why do we still have wars? Well, to begin with, the slight error. We haven't had 2,000 years of Christianity. We haven't had 2,000 minutes of it. We've had 2,000 years of a church that calls itself by the name of Christianity, but which only in a very small measure practices it. I was on a steamer a few years ago going to the islands, there's a group of missionaries on board going to the Orient to he <laughs> reform the heathen, I guess. Each one of those missionaries had equipment with them to the value 
a minimum value of $10,000. No missionary was permitted to go to the Orient without an equipment, a minimum value of which must be $10,000. Ten, ten thousand American dollars. Each missionary consisted of, how they call these automobile things that they live in, trailers, iceless refrigerators, electric stoves, all the rest of those things. Well, a group of us sat at dinner one night, these missionaries, ministers, wives, and the subject was the Bible, and they were talking about the Bible. And I suppose every once in a while I had a little something to say about it because I happen to like the Bible. One of these men turned to me finally and said, Well, you do know the Bible, don't you? What is your church? Oh, I said, I don't have any. What do you mean? Don't you belong to a church? No. Well, how do you know so much about the Bible? Oh, well, I suppose if I try to explain it, I'd have to say this. I had so many problems in life that I was looking for a principle to live by that would uh, sort of get me out of my problems. And one of the books I studied was the Bible. And I found a principle in there that I could live by. I really can't uh, live by it 100%. I'm not quite that good. But at least I can live by it enough to solve most of my problems. Well, then, uh, why don't you join a church? Oh, well, the principle I found uh, wouldn't be acceptable, accepted by a church. What? Uh, a principle in the Bible that wouldn't be accepted by a church? Yeah, that's what I mean. Well, what is that principle? I said, oh, there's a fellow there named Jesus Christ, and he has a wonderful principle of life, and to the extent to which you can embody it in your life, it does wonderful things for you. Why, he said, we're built on the uh, teaching of Jesus Christ, our church is. I said, are you kidding? <laughs> oh, no, he said. So is this man. Why, his church is founded on the teachings of Jesus Christ. I said, just think of that. At my age, born and brought up in America, I never knew there was a church that would even accept the teachings in it. As you astound me, I'm certainly going to join one of those churches when I get back home. Why, certainly. Why? We, we're founded on the teaching of Jesus Christ. I said, well, tell me this. In this war that just came to an end, how many days each week did you set aside for praying for the enemy? <laughs> well, of course, they hadn't gotten around to that. Well, I said, uh, did you have days of prayer for uh, our people and our boys? Oh, yes. Well, it seems to me the master said there wasn't any profit, and that wouldn't be any good. Profiteth nothing to pray for your friends or your relatives, he said. Didn't he? That's the way I read it. He said even the scribes and Pharisees do that, but it doesn't do them any good. What'd you waste time for? Well, they didn't remember that either. Well, did you send any chaplains out to war? <clears throat> oh, of course we did. Sure, in defiance of the Master's teaching. The Master said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And I suppose your chaplains told the boys they were going to pray for them and get them into heaven if they died, or they maybe even were going to get God's protection to keep them alive. You were lying to those boys, weren't you? And calling it Christ. What? Well, that's what he said. He said, those that live by the sword will die by the sword. Definitely, that's what it says there. No place in the book does he authorize wars or deaths or killings. As a matter of fact, whenever anyone died and he was around, he raised them up to life. He didn't read any funeral ceremonies. Not that man. Uh -uh. Nor did he ever say that God said you should go out there and get killed. Oh, no. If you lose your life for my sake, in demonstration of the principle of spiritual power, that's one thing. But to go out there, why do you know what he said? We have no right to save our lives at the expense of the other fellow's life. No right to do it. No right to avenge ourselves. If the other fellow smites us on one side, let him smite the other two. And if he wants a vest, give him a coat too. And what are you doing telling these boys that they have the right under Christ to go out and commit murder so that their mothers and fathers of the old generation can stay alive a few more years? That's noble. That's Christian, isn't it? Oh, they sat there and they took it. 
Then after a while I said, you know what I'd like to know too? How do you stand on spiritual healing about sort of raising the dead and healing the sick? Well, of course, uh, they couldn't do that either. Well, I suppose let me put the question now the other way around. Which of Jesus' teachings are you founded on? And that's the answer I got. One woman, the wife of one of the ministers, said, You know, Mr. Goldsmith, I've been unhappy for many, many years and haven't known why. But she said, I see it so clearly. We've got everything in our church but Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, you know, <clears throat> it's sad, but don't think for a minute that every word of this isn't true. It does say in Scripture that the scribes and the Pharisees pray for their friends and relatives and it profited them nothing. You must pray for your enemies. It says in Scripture that you must pray 70 times 7, forgive 70 times 7, that you must not avenge yourselves, you must not even protect yourself. Put up thy sword. It does say that. And it does preach spiritual healing. And it does preach all the rest of the things. Forgiveness of sin. Why, the church condemns it. If you just sin according to their laws, you get excommunicated. Why, even in an enlightened church like the Christian Science Church, and that is more enlightened than most of them, even in that church, if they catch you at uh, committing adultery, they excommunicate you. Well, I'm not excusing adultery, but I'm saying this, that there's nothing in the law of Christ that says a person should be excommunicated for it. They should be healed. They should be shown the way of wisdom or permitted to go their own way. But where does it say that you're to draw a line and excommunicate? Oh, no, he didn't even excommunicate the woman caught in adultery. Certainly not. He took the thief right into heaven with him. No, 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 no. Let's get square with the teaching of Jesus Christ and find out that we haven't had Christianity. If we had had Christianity, we would have had brotherly love. We would have done unto others as we would have had them do unto us. And let us say after the First World War, we would have gone into Germany and helped them to rebuild and we would have helped to feed their people instead of denude the country of its coal and its iron and its steel and forbid food to go in but take everything out until they had to raise up a Hitler before they could get food. The Allies wouldn't give it to them. The Allies let them starve. The Allies let them go to pieces. They had to raise up a Hitler to get it by force. Well, we wouldn't have had World War II if we had had Christianity I won't say that, well, it wouldn't have been World War I instead of in Christianity, but if Christianity had come in even after World War I, there wouldn't have been World War II. No, we had no Christianity. We had business, big business. <clears throat> At about what age do you think parents can start instilling the infinite way in a child? Five minutes after conception. <laughs> And that's the only time to begin, unless you don't hear about it until later. Because right at that moment it becomes necessary to know that man is not a creator and that no child is beginning its life. The life of that child is God and it is infinite and spiritual and eternal and it had its beginning before Abraham was and it's going to continue living unto the end of time. It coexists with God. And it is not subject to mortal beliefs about human conception or human birth. It is not confined to a mortal or material body. It is not under the laws of matter. It exists as the unfolding of God consciousness, and that means an infinite, eternal, and harmonious consciousness, not subject to human beliefs, medical theories, or theological theories. That's the time to begin to teach the child, and by the time the child comes out into the world, it will be almost illumined because it will have been separated from the limiting world beliefs. And then from the time that it begins its outside experience, the truth of being should be known to that child because here's what we fail to understand. We brought this out in the class today. If we here were to meet once a day for a year, you know what would happen to us? You, as well as me? We'd all be so much more illumined a year from now than we are this minute 
that there'd be no fooling about it. Just one hour a day for a year and the spiritual power that would be flowing in and through us from one of us to another would be so great that so far as we are concerned, sin, disease, poverty would never enter our consciousness anymore. It would be so ruled out that we wouldn't any more think of it than we would think of earning a living by stealing it. It just wouldn't be a part of our makeup. Sin wouldn't be. Disease wouldn't be. It wouldn't be a part of our conscious thought at all. One year of this kind of a meeting, once a day, would rule it all out of us. And we'd so love God and the things of God that we'd love each other for the ability to share it with each other. Why is that true? Well, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men unto me. And so wherever there is one or two or three of us here, with a degree of spiritual illumination, all those who have brought themselves into this aura or vibration or consciousness, whatever word you want to use, will partake of it. And now let me tell you something about the child. You may think that the child doesn't know what's going on in the home or what you're thinking or what the father is thinking. <coughs> Don't make any mistake. Don't make any mistake. There was a telephone call back here just before we came on the platform. A child was screaming with agony. A little baby. Mother couldn't tell why. For an hour, she had, this child had been screaming. Why? The father's out drunk and the mother's sitting there worried about it. You think that child, that baby doesn't know it? Don't kid yourself. That child is a part of the consciousness of its parents. It may not be in the womb, but it's in the consciousness of those parents, and it knows just what's going on there, and it's subject unto it. And just the same, when you go into an office of a person imbued with the Christ, you feel a lightness and a release. You go into an office of a person laden down with fear and disease, and you go out feeling a burden on your shoulder. You can't help it, because you've made yourself a part of their consciousness and you partake of it. You come into this room when there is spiritual teaching going on, you can't help taking on part of the nature of the spirituality that is being expressed. And you keep it up long enough and you'll find it's enveloped your whole being and your whole body. The same with children. Children do not have to be taught. I've said this over and over again, that there is no harm in Sunday school. But... Uh, the amount of good is limited for the simple reason that you as an adult or I as an adult could not learn spiritual truth in one hour in a week even if we were taught it properly. And the average Sunday school child is not taught it properly because there aren't that many good Sunday school teachers. Now then, if they were, however, that one hour a week would make very little impression on that child's mind. What counts in that child's mind is seven days a week in the home. And if the mother is continuously berating the child, if the mother is continuously instilling fear, you must eat this because it's good for you, and you mustn't cross the street because it's bad for you, and you mustn't talk to strangers because... By the time that parent gets through with the child, the child's a nervous wreck, and it's a wonder that it trusts anything in the world. You remember in one of our manuscripts I told the story of the parent that took the child out on the street and had him jump from the first step, and the father caught the child, he put the child on the second step and said, jump, and uh, the father caught the child. He put the child on the third step and said, jump, and he let the child fall. And the child started to cry, and he says, you see, never trust anybody, not even your father. Well, that child got a very concrete lesson in not trusting. But see the opposite effect if the parent, without any direct teaching, has a confidence in the invisible powers of spirit and let their child eat what the child's appetite wants it to eat, not because it's good, not because it's bad, but because the only power in the food is the power of God. Or the parent that lets the child go out on the street saying, I'm not letting you out on the street, I'm letting you out in God, or sends the child to school saying, I'm not sending you to school, I'm sending you out in God, and so forth and so on. The parent, in its confidence in the infinite invisible, transmits it through consciousness to the child, even without a Sunday school lesson, even without anything but their own example. Just as that child growing up and witnessing quarrels between the parents. You don't mean to tell me you think that Sunday school is going to teach that child anything about love? No. Seven days a week it's got fights at home. How's it going to believe a Sunday school teacher about love? 
No, in the infinite way, while I suppose that here and there there are some teaching children in Sunday school, and more and more will go on, I will always claim this, that the message of the infinite way must be taught by example by the parents, the guardians. They must live it in their consciousness, and it will transmit itself to the child. Please explain the Bible statement, God so loved the world that he gave his own son to save it. <clears throat> I wouldn't like to make a stab at that one. Personally, I don't know whether it has been translated to suit a purpose or not, because in its literal sense, of course, it isn't true, and its spiritual sense might mean that that Christ, which is the Son of God within us, is there to save us from these material beliefs. That's the way I would translate that. In its literal sense, I wouldn't even believe it. God's world being perfect, what was to be saved? That's true. God's world being perfect, there is nothing to be saved. That's why, if we believe that Jesus was sent into the world by God to save it, we must think God's pretty cruel for not having sent the Son generations before that to save it when it was equally needed. The only way we can explain these things is spiritually, that there has developed down through the ages a mortal material sense of existence, and the Christ of our consciousness does dissolve it and reveal spiritual illumination. You want to go home? No. All right, don't blame me then. <coughs> Why is it that when I practice the presence, a great pressure or ache appears on the back of my neck? How can it be overcome? Well, I'm going to tell you something, that you're making the old metaphysical uh, mistake of knowing the truth with the human mind. You are using the human mind and thinking that you're practicing the presence. You aren't practicing the presence at all. You think you are, and your intentions are good, but you're failing. That is like the days of old when practitioners used to get severe headaches by the end of the day, also at the back of the neck. The reason they were giving mental treatment, they were pounding out mental statements, they were working as hard as a person trying to figure out a foundation for a skyscraper. No wonder they got headaches from it. Now, to practice the presence of God is not a mental process. It is a spiritual process, and it does not involve thinking thoughts, making statements, or affirmations, or denials. If you are indulging the making of affirmations or denials or reciting a lot of statements of truth, you not only are going to get a headache, but before you get through, you're going to have lots more aches too. To practice the presence of God is not a mental process. It is a mode of realization. And let us see how that's accomplished. If we awaken in the morning, and our first thought before we get out of bed is, thank you, Father, this is your day, that's practicing the presence of God, and it can't give you a headache. It's nothing more or less than an acknowledgement or a recognition of God's presence. When you go to the breakfast table, if you happen to just look up and say, thank you, Father, that's practicing the presence of God, it's acknowledging God as the source of your food, of your supply. If when you pay out money or receive money, you silently declare to yourself, thank you, Father, you're acknowledging the presence of God and the power of God as the source and substance of your supply. If during the day you remember that the presence goes before you to make the crooked place straight, now you don't recite that ten times, you merely remember that the presence goes before you. Probably going out of a door is a good time to remind yourself that the presence goes before me to make the crooked place straight. Or if you get into your automobile or a bus or a streetcar, it is a good thing to remember. Thank you, Father. There's only one mind, not only driving this, but uh, it's the only driver on the road. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. I see there's nothing mental about that. There's no pressure about that. 
nor do you have to sit down in a corner of the room and practice the presence. As a matter of fact, I don't believe you can do it that way. I honestly don't. The only way to practice the presence is the way St. Francis did it. If you're on your knees scrubbing the kitchen floor, say, thank you, Father, that you've given me this job to do, and I'm going to do it the best of my ability. And if somebody says it's time to go down to the truth center for a lesson, and you've got to be there scrubbing the floor or preparing the meal, say, I don't have to go to a truth center to be spiritual. I'll be spiritual while I'm preparing dinner, because God is just as well here as at that truth center. And so if you acknowledge that the place where on you stand is holy ground, if you will acknowledge that whatever work you have been given to do this moment represents the activity of God on your level of consciousness, you're practicing the presence of God. If when you uh, see sin, disease, lack limitation around on the street, in the newspaper, on the radio, you merely correct that within yourself with the realization, no, that can't exist in God's world, you've practiced the presence of God. That's all there is to practicing the presence. This thing of sitting down in a chair for 10, 20, 30 minutes or an hour and making believe that God is there, that's not practicing the presence or trying to get God to be there. God was there before you sat down. You didn't have to do any practicing to get God there. Oh, no. And Jesus said, no more shall you worship in this holy mountain nor in that temple in Jerusalem. In other words, not that you shouldn't go there if you like, but stop believing that you're going to practice the presence of God in a temple, in a synagogue, in a truth center, in a church. You're not. You're going to practice the presence of God where you are, where the temple of God is your own consciousness. You've got to worship God in spirit and in truth, right where you are, and that's practicing the presence of God. Anything else is a mental mumbo-jumbo trying to bring about something that you believe doesn't already exist. Now, don't try to make God present because you can't do it. God was present long before you ever thought about it, awaiting your recognition. So all you could do in practicing the presence is give recognition to the truth that right here and now God is. But you know, God was here even before Abraham was. God was here before Jesus Christ was born. That surprises a lot of people and shocks them. Shocks them terribly. One of my former friends, a good Christian science teacher, was shocked when I dared make the assertion that God was on earth before Jesus Christ. No such thing. No such thing. Only Jesus Christ brought God. Yet he said, before Abraham was, I am. How could it have been otherwise if he hadn't said it? No, he didn't say it because he made it so. He said it because it was actually true. God is omnipresent, and you can't practice the presence and make it happen. God is omnipresent, and you can recognize it. You can acknowledge it. You can acknowledge him in all thy ways. You know something? If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. You see, nobody can make that happen. It is already true. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. That's practicing the presence of God. That isn't bringing God into the presence of death. That's acknowledging that even in the presence of death, thou art already there, even before I got there. So stop this nonsense of sitting down somewhere and closing the eyes and thinking you're practicing the presence of God. You're only practicing the presence of God when you're going on around your daily business and acknowledging that God's walking around with you. Is the soul and subconscious mind one and the same? If not, what is the subconscious mind? Well, as a matter of fact, who says there is a subconscious mind? So far as uh, we know in spiritual science and spiritual truth, there is only one mind. And nowhere in Scripture does it tell us about being divided up. That's all part of Materia Medica, and you won't find it in the teachings of Jesus. Nothing there about the subconscious mind. Nothing there in the teaching of Shankara, nothing in the teaching of Buddha about it, nothing in the teaching of Krishna about it, nothing in the teaching of John about it, nothing in the teaching of Paul about it. Not a thing about the subconscious mind. You only find the subconscious mind when you get into Materia Medica, when you get into psychology and uh, psychiatry. And uh, you say, well, but doesn't that prove it? 
Well, it doesn't to me, because I heard Dr. Menninger say, and he's supposed to be the greatest psychologist and psychiatrist of this day, he said on a national broadcast one night, when he was asked, have you cured this, have you cured that, have you cured the other thing? He said, well, no, so far we haven't cured anything, but we know we're on the right track. <laughs> well, that's all right. If they are, they'll prove there is a subconscious. But so far, they haven't proven a subconscious. What they have proven is this, that there are states and stages of... There are some things that you know right now because it's in common use with you. There are some things that are stored up in your memory. There are some things that you have to search quite deeply for before you remember them. But it doesn't mean that it's a different mind you get it out of. It just means that it's something that isn't an act of use. Now, uh, so far as our teaching is concerned, we are not interested in the subconscious mind or the superconscious mind since we are <coughs> dealing with just one thing, and that is that God is the mind of the individual. If that mind is divided up, as Jesus said, into many mansions, into many states and stages of consciousness, well and good. But it isn't a different mind, and uh, calling it subconscious doesn't help us. It gets us into the same confusion that we got into in Christian science with the word mortal mind, the term mortal mind. Now, those of you who have ever had experience in Christian science will remember hearing such statements as, oh, if you only knew what mortal mind is doing to me today. Oh, I wonder what mortal mind means by this. Oh, well, did you not? Isn't that mortal mind for you? And yet, Mrs. Eddy says in the textbook, the term mortal mind is a solecism, a word, a term denoting nothingness. There is in reality no mortal mind. And how many times you'll hear Christian scientists talking about what mortal mind is doing to them today? Now, the same way. All metaphysicians in every school have been deluded by the word illusion. And we still get telephone calls. Will you help me get rid of this illusion? Now, please, think about that, will you, for a minute? Help me get rid of this illusion. If you know it's an illusion, is there anything to get rid of anymore? No. The only thing that ever fools anybody is to believe it's a reality. Once they know it's an illusion, they're not bound by it anymore. When you go out on the desert and you see a city, that may fool you, and you may say to someone, help me get through that city. But after you come to the realization that it isn't a city, that it's only an illusion, you can't ask anybody to help you anymore. You've gotten all the help there is in the world. You know that what appeared to be something real is non-existent. And that's all the rest of the healing work. The moment you can be brought to a place where you can say, this isn't an actual physical condition of discord, this is an illusion, well, what do you want to bother with it? You don't need any more help. The help you need is to come to that point of saying, this is an illusion. After that, forget about it, you're healed. Do we become illumined when the conscious and subconscious me? Well, I don't know anything about subconscious. I'll tell you when we become illumined. That I can tell you. As we progress along the spiritual path, first place we get onto the spiritual path, not of our own accord. Nobody in the history of the world ever chose deliberately the spiritual path. Everyone is brought to it, and they're brought to it with something within themselves. It either is a love of God or a search for God or it's a terrible problem that's turned them toward God for the solution. That's how they get on the spiritual path. Then, having entered the spiritual path, they persist. And they keep up the reading of metaphysical or spiritual literature. They bring themselves into contact with people on the spiritual path. They find teachers or teachings or books. And each day they fill themselves a little more, a little more, a little more with the spiritual truth and spiritual reality. As they do this, they are developing the inner faculties or spiritual faculties. And one day, one marvelous day, the realization of a spiritual truth is far greater than the fear of material circumstances. And when that day comes, 
they are so firmly planted on the spiritual path that they continue and they're led. Now they may be led by a teaching or a teacher on the outer plane. And it may even be an erroneous teacher or an erroneous teaching. There's no harm in that. The great example of that, of course, is Saul of Tarsus. He didn't, couldn't have had a worse teacher so far as spiritual illumination is concerned. He couldn't have had a better teacher so far as the letter of the religion of Judaism is concerned. He couldn't have had a worse teacher so far as spiritual realities are concerned. But that did not stop him. What drove Saul of Tarsus was an innate love of God and a zeal for God and determination to find God and in spite of hell and high water, in spite of false teachers and bad teachings, he was illumined. But he was driven to it by his need for it, by his desire for it, by his hunger for God. And so it is. We on this path may follow a wrong teaching for a while or a wrong teacher. It doesn't make any difference. What counts is the degree of zeal, the degree of sacrifice, the degree of the giving up of self that enters into our search for God and then one of these days we are led in the right direction to the right teaching or the right teacher and it may be a teaching or a teacher on the outer plane or it may be one on the inner plane. There are teachers on the inner plane. Sometimes you do not recognize them. You merely take it as, uh, well, such terms as a still small voice. You take it as something impersonal. But there are teachers on the inner plane within your consciousness and they can teach you even better than the teachers on the outer plane once the contact has been made. Now then, you can't make it, you can't search for it, you can't seek for it, and you never will. But at the right time in your development, they come to you. You can't go to them and that's why you can't hasten it, that's why you can't hurry it can't do a thing about it, nor can you find them or seek them out. All you can do is take the books you've got today and study those. Go to the teachers you have today and study with them, and go into meditation. Live with spiritual literature. Live with the wonderful spiritual gems that have come down to us through all ages, and fill your consciousness with this love of God, this love of service this desire to give up that mad self that must make demonstrations, that must accomplish, achieve, acquire, and uh, learn to live not for the demonstration's sake, but for the demonstrator's sake, for an awareness of God, not for an awareness of a good demonstration. And then in the moment that ye think not, the moment that you're not thinking, in the moment that you're not even on the subject, the bridegroom cometh. In that moment, your inner teacher springs forth and says, here I am, I've been waiting for you to be ready. Now I'll take over. And then you'll say with Paul, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me, or like Jesus, I can of my own self do nothing. The Father within me, there's your teacher, there's your inner teacher. In the last analysis, we shall all be taught of God. There is your inner teacher. The inner teacher will appear and you will call him a man, or you will call him Christ, or you will call him the Father, depending on its manner of presentation to you. That will be an individual thing. But you will be taught from a wellspring of information, of wisdom within your own being. But you can't bring it about. All you can do is continue your study and search on this outer plane plus meditation. Take advantage of, well, when you meditate, if you make uh, this part of your meditation, Father, lead me to my teacher or my teaching, in some miraculous way, it will be placed in your hand. One of our friends has told us here of how a neighbor brought the infinite way to her, a neighbor who couldn't understand it and admitted, I don't understand it, maybe you like it. Well, that's a good way to have it brought to you, isn't it? What difference does it make how it gets there, if only it gets there?
comes that way or if a neighbor comes and brings the book to us or in some other way we get on the path what counts is what do we do after we get on the path and that's what determines the rest if we stick with it if our curiosity to know God is greater than our desire just to make demonstrations we make it inevitable that the day comes when we pass from purely material consciousness to spiritual consciousness and then the teacher comes and it may be a teacher on the outer plane or it may be a teacher on the inner plane or it may be a teacher on the outer plane for a while and then a teacher on the inner plane each one's experience is different I have never had a teacher on the outer plane I had a Christian science teacher a class teacher who just showed us the little things that we're supposed to learn in the books but I don't call that spiritual teaching a real spiritual teacher is the one who not only imparts the letter of truth but keeps us with them long enough to raise us up in consciousness to where we can spiritually apprehend truth and that can't be done in 12 days it cannot be done it is possible for people like we are here to have class and be illumined in a one week or two week class but that's only because of the years of study and preparation that have gone before and the fact that we sometimes find a spiritual teacher doing the teaching capable of opening that consciousness to us just in the same way that the Christian science practitioner in Detroit was the first one to give me the first trace of spiritual illumination now then <clears throat> the uh, illumination comes then when uh, we have been on the path and when we have come to the place of stopping the search for demonstration and started the search for the demonstrator when we're no longer concerned with the gifts but with the giver well we have one last question there is one power then are not all demonstrations upheld by this power be they so-called good or bad how could they be bad if there is only one power there could be no such thing as a bad demonstration and as a matter of fact there is no such thing as bad there is no such thing as evil there is only good and uh, our misconception of that good at times which through finite sense makes us call it evil there couldn't any more be an entity or identity called evil than there could be such an actual thing as darkness there's no such thing as darkness nobody could ever put darkness under a microscope and examine it darkness is nothing but an absence of light there is no such thing as ignorance you can't get a hold of a piece of ignorance and examine it ignorance is just the absence or seeming absence of intelligence and so there is no such thing as evil there is only a suppositional absence of uh, the good and what it is is this all evil may be summed up as a false sense all evil as a false sense there is only good but we can either entertain the true knowledge of it or we can have a false sense of it it's just as if there were a magnificent oil painting over here by a great master and I who know nothing about oil paintings were to look at it and say I wouldn't give you a dime a dozen that would not be because of its lack of value that would be because of my false sense of it or somebody playing a marvelous piece of music and my saying I don't want to hear it it wouldn't be because the music isn't good it's because I am entertaining a false sense of music when that false sense is corrected in me I see the painting as it is or hear the music as it is and then say why it was good all the time thank you, thank you.